and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to, script, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. That there is the culmination of the gospel. That's the supremacy of what the gospel is. For me, I'm happy that I have eternal life. Um, I think the monitors are going to be a little hot. Sorry, I just... I noticed when I swing my body to the left, <laughs> that little bit of a re. <laughs> if I turn any more to the left, we're all going to know it. <laughs> we tend to be, oops. Well, okay. <laughs> I now have the freedom to move about. <laughs> It's a work in progress. We, my son was here. He, he did help us with a few things. But as you can tell, we're still making our way through some of the technological advantages of our systems. So fortunately, I have very large lungs. So I'm hoping that, you know, no matter what happens with the sound system, you'll still be able to hear me. Um, we tend to be, okay, this is football playoff season. You may have noticed I, this is just something for me, but I found my Patriot jacket, which was really neat. You know, this is the beauty of when you've had all your stuff in storage for two years. You find things and you forgot that you had them. And so I have my beautiful Patriot jacket, which is beautiful, one, because it's a Patriot jacket, sure, but it was because I got it as a closeout sale at a little store, so I look at it and I think, that was such a great deal. And it's warm, but so those are totally asides. But it is football season, so you may have noticed yesterday wildcard playoffs started. Well, that always brings up something because you always have the people in the stands who will put up John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... <laughs> Believes in him should not perish, but have ever have eternal life. That tends to be a scripture that we see. And so people will put the scripture up. Well, that's great. But it doesn't matter where you go in the scriptures. The entire scriptures have the gospel in them. Dr. Um, Gris, w. A. Griswold decided that he was going to preach through the Bible. And he started at 7 o'clock one night, and by midnight was still going as he preached the gospel as found in each of the books of the Bible. Now, fortunately, I will not be doing that today because we would be here for a little while. But that's the beauty of the gospel is that cut the Bible anywhere and it bleeds. And it bleeds the red of Christ. Um, The gospel means the good news. And the good news is summed up very easily for us in verses 3 and 4 of this passage of scripture. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that is, in the culmination, the good news of the gospel. Phil Knight, who is the founder of Nike, he started the company in 1972, and in less than two decades, it became one of the strongest and most well-recognized companies in the world. It was the unique and unforgettable advertising really that powered its phenomenal growth. When you think of classic Nike advertising, you think of superstar athletes like Michael Jordan, 
Charles Barkley and Bo Jackson, you think of the phrase, just do it. You think of Spike Lee muttering about Michael Jordan, it's got to be the shoes. Or Charles Barkley announcing, just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. Well, in 1994 at the Cannes Film Festival, the festival recognized the consistent creativity and impact of Nike's advertising by naming Nike the advertiser of the year that year. This is unimaginable, though, to anybody who knew how Phil Knight, the CEO of Nike, felt about advertising back in 1981. And that's when Nike, that's when Phil Knight first hired an ad agency. When he met with the ad agency's president, though, Knight told him to his face, I hate advertising. Think about that, 1981, I hate advertising. The greatest advertiser in the world once hated advertising. The company made by advertising started the relationship with its ad agency skeptical and dubious. That is the same way that many people start their relationship with the gospel. They start off hating it, maybe even like Saul of Tarshish, who hated it so much that he set about persecuting Christians before the Lord met him and converted him to Paul, the apostle. So, Paul declares this good news again in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The gospel is the death of burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the person and work of Christ describes the most important events in human history. It's why we say, first and foremost, the gospel is primary. Otherwise, it would not have any near, any, anywhere near the traction that it has right now. Paul said it's of first importance. The gospel isn't incidental. It's fundamental to our faith. And so Paul is saying, listen up, pay attention to the gospel, and never forget it. The gospel's not only primary, but also powerful. It's no wonder Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's what we stand on. It's what we know to be first and foremost. And it's why that no matter what, no matter how foolish it may seem to the world, we stand on it and know it to be true. And it's foundational for us. It is the core of everything that we believe. The gospel is the good news because we had a problem of sin. Now, think about it when you go to see a jeweler. Anybody do diamond shopping? Okay, I didn't say, does anybody sell diamonds? <laughs> she would be able to tell us about the process. But when you went to look at diamonds, um, I got to do this. Uh, most guys, when they get married, have had this opportunity. I am able to say that when I went diamond shopping, before I started, I knew nothing about diamonds. I had never paid attention to them. I had never dreamed about them. I'd never thought about them in a ring or anything like it. I just didn't do it. But I noticed, and fortunately I had friends, so I had gone with friends when they went to go buy rings, which I thought found incredibly amusing because at the time I wasn't dating anybody, so it was wonderful. And we're going in and he's telling them what he's gonna pay and I'm going, you're gonna pay what? <laughs> But the jeweler would, would come out, and they'd come out to that counter, 
And the very first thing they did was they took out that black velvet. And they put the diamonds onto the black velvet. And then they would start to talk about their cut, their clarity, and all of these things. And they give them letter grades and all sorts of wonderful pieces. And they talked all about them. But they showed up so much better on the black velvet. Well, in the same way that we had a problem of sin, the gospel was applied to that problem of sin. Just as the jeweler took the diamond and put it on that dark fabric so that it shone so much better, that's how bright the gospel shines when, it, when looked at in relation to the problem of sin that we had because we had a problem of sin that we could do nothing about. God places the gospel right onto this backdrop. Sin is so tragic, so damning, so vile that it takes the very precious blood of God's only Son to forgive our sins. Sin is a defiance. It's a trespass against the laws of God. Sin is a debt. And Romans 6, 2 tells us the wages of sin is death. Jesus paid a debt that he didn't owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. Sin is a disease for which there is no cure but the gospel. There's no other way to deal with sin. Even our righteousness, our very best, is still filthy rags. Sin is a distance that separates us from God. Even God's Son bearing the sins of the world at that moment on the cross, was separated from the Father. He became the forsaken of God. In Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is what Jesus cried out. Sin is death. It's a living death without God. Which leads us into the second point, which is death itself. The good news is that Jesus died for our sins. It was a voluntary death. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. It was a vicarious death. Vicarious literally means a substitution. It was paid for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, that means there was absolutely nothing that we could do. Which is why it's never earned. You can never work your way to salvation. The only way you have salvation is by accepting it as a gift from God. Given by grace of God his, himself. To meet a debt that we couldn't pay. God made that way. It was a voluntary death. He suffered our, say, our shame, our sin, our sorrows, and died. He did it voluntarily. It was a sacrifice. It was a vicarious death, a substitution. It was also a victorious death because on the cross, Jesus defeated the powers of sin, death, and hell. That's why we sing victory in Jesus, which at the close of the service, we're going to sing victory in Jesus so that we can remember why this is that we have this fundamental. This is the core of who we are as Christians. All right here, very easy for us. Philip Yancey says of the biographies that he's read, including biographies of men like Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi, who died violent and politically significant deaths, few of them devote more than 10% of the pages to the subject's death. But when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, they dedicate over a third of their content to the last week of Jesus' life. That's how significant it is. Which brings us to the third point, which is burial. Not only did Jesus die for our sin, he was buried. 
The Bible teaches us that when Jesus was buried, our sins were buried with him. He remembers them no more. That's huge. Because it's... It was interesting, Christian, as he hadn't had a chance since going to school, getting married, doing all that, to come home and get all his stuff. And so we, part of what we moved was all of his stuff that we'd had in storage as well. And so one of the things that he had a bunch of jackets and he was trying to pack up all his jackets because I guess and apparently in Costa Mesa, you can go from you know 70 degrees and go up to the mountains to 40 degrees. Now, makes me wonder why in the world I'd ever want to do that. I could see myself staying. But so he's standing there trying to figure out what jackets to take. And his mother, playing from Pilgrim's Progress, goes, Christian, it's just like Pilgrim's Progress when you have a burden on your, on your shoulders. And then it's taken off. But that's what it is. Our sins were buried with Christ's death. He remembers them no more. And by baptism, that's that beautiful picture of what happens. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Romans 6.3. That is, we identify with him in his death, his cross. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall also certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his, which if you go to Romans 6 is verses 4 and 5. So baptism pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which brings us to the fourth one, which is the resurrection. The gospel is not only that he died, was buried, and that he rose again. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. According to 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus is still in the grave, our faith is foolish, our lives are futile, and our preaching is worthless. It would be better off to have done nothing if the resurrection doesn't happen. Because then it's just a story of some guy who did something. But the resurrection changes absolutely everything. Because it shows the very death of sin. For it is sin that brought death into our lives. And so when sin was defeated, when Jesus was raised from the dead and appeared to his followers, it also says in scripture that other people were raised too. It's an amazing thing. Nothing like it had ever happened. And that was only a brief glimpse into what's going to happen. Just, just as a cheater, but if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it talks about those that are dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay? That four, just in case you're wondering, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, sorry. I jumped ahead there, but it's about the rapture. And when Jesus steps out to call his people home, the very first people answering the call are the ones in the grave. And they're going to come shooting out of the ground. You want to talk about something that's going to make an impact in people's lives. I don't know how they're going to explain what happens. But I'm thankful that if I'm still living, I'm going next. It's going to be absolutely unbelievable. It was also incredibly scary back in the 80s when they first brought out those movies and you would watch the movies and then you would be like, you'd, you'd come home and nobody was home. And you're going, oh my gosh, did I miss it? Did I miss the rapture? Fortunately, Scripture tells us it's going to be a loud trumpet. So I'm pretty sure we're all going to know. But that's 
where the difference is. Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. That's Romans 4.25. The gospel is also powerful to secure because in 1 Corinthians 15.1 15, it says, in which you stand. We stand upon a solid rock. Remember, we, we sing the song, on Christ the solid rock I stand. Well, it doesn't matter if you're trembling as you stand there because the rock of Christ isn't. We can tremble, but the foundation upon which we are trembles not. It's a solid foundation. It's not quicksand. We're not going to sink into it. When everything else is falling down all around you, you can stand. That's the core of the gospel. Gary Habermas talks about this when he talked about when his wife Debbie caught the flu and ended up passing away. And he says, when she didn't get better, we went to the hospital for tests. And the first thing the doctor said to Debbie was, you've got some serious problems. Debbie learned she had stomach cancer. Four months later, she passed away at the age of 43. During Debbie's suffering, I took the refuge in the truth of Jesus' resurrection. It had been my major research area for 25 years, and I appreciated a student who asked, what would you do now if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead? I told him that Jesus' bodily resurrection is the center of the Christian faith. After he died on the cross to pay for our sins, Jesus was raised from the dead. He appeared to many in his physical body, that was now immortal, knowing that helped me while Debbie was dying. I imagine what God might say to me in response to my questions about Debbie. He would ask Gary, did I raise my son from the dead? Of course you did, Lord, I would say, but why is Debbie dying? Gary, did I raise my son from the dead? The question would come again. I imagine God repeating the same question until I got the point. If Jesus had been raised, I can trust that Debbie will be raised someday too. And it was sufficient to know that because of Jesus' resurrection and because Debbie and I belong to Jesus, we will be together again for all eternity. The gospel that saves us also grows us. In verses 1 and 2, in the English Standard Version, it says, I would remind you of the gospel I preach to you, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. That is, we are always being saved. The same gospel that saves us, keeps us, and grows us. We're being made more and more like Christ. I have been saved I am being saved, and I will be ultimately saved, finally in the presence of Christ. In World Vision, writer Tony Campolo tells of taking an airplane from California to Philadelphia on a stormy night. It was late, but when the man in the seat learned that Campolo was a Christian, he wanted to talk. I believe that going to heaven is like going to Philadelphia, the man said. You can get there by airplane, by train, by bus, and by automobile. There are many ways to get to Philadelphia. Campolo writes, As we started descending into Philadelphia, the place was fogged in. The wind was blowing, the rain was beating on the plane, and everyone looked nervous and tight. As we were circling in the fog, I turned to the theological expert on my right. I'm certainly glad that the pilot doesn't agree with your theology. What do you mean, he asked. The people in the control booth are giving instructions to the pilot. Coming north by northwest, three degrees. You're on beam, you're on beam, don't deviate from beam. I'm glad the pilot's not saying there are many ways into the airport. There are many approaches we can take. I'm glad he's saying there's only one way we can land this plane and I'm going to stay with it. And that is the same with the gospel. There is one way and only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ, his son. That's first, foremost, that's it. 
But that's the truth, and that's the supremacy of the gospel. That's what we stand on. That's what forms our faith. That's what changes things in our lives. It's the beauty of turning our lives over to the Lord, repenting and saying, God, I've been doing it my way. It's not working. I want to turn my life over to you. And God takes all the weight, everything you've been carrying, and he lifts it off your shoulders and lays it aside and remembers that weight and sin no more. He sets us free from it. He sets us on the path towards his presence. And that's the freedom that we walk in. That's what the gospel is. That's what Christianity is. It's all about that relationship with God. That's why we come. That's why we worship the Lord here. And that's what we carry to the people in the community around us. They need to know that hope. Now, one of the things that I've been caught by, and um, Debbie did send out, or Deb, sorry, I don't, if I mess up with your names, if you prefer long or short, I'm sorry, I will get it. So Deb um, did send out the prayer request. The real estate agent that Teresa and I had been talking to, um, when I talked to her on Monday about something about the apartment, she, uh, she said at the end of the conversation, she said, Pastor, do you mind if I ask you for a favor? Sure, why not? And she says, my 18-year-old son's father passed away this week, and he is really struggling with it. Would you pray? And I said, yeah, of course. And then I also asked her if she'd mind if I passed it to the prayer team so that we could all pray for this young man by the name of Jack. Because she said, his world's falling apart, so mine is too. Because she loves him so much. And that's what the people around us need. The people around us need to be able to say, no matter what it is, if they want prayer, we need to be able to pray for them. Pray for them then, pray for them with, through the prayer team, but just loving and caring for them that way. That's the best outreach that we could ever do. Why? Because it doesn't rely on us. It's simply saying, yeah, I can pray. And you know what? God answers prayer. And he will meet the needs far better than I ever could. Because that's who we're trusting. And that's who they need to meet with. They need to see that God cares so much about them that even the little things in their lives, the things they think are so insignificant, God knows the very hair on their heads. He knows all of that about them already. So God will meet their needs. And that's what we need to do. And so that's my challenge to you this week, is to take the faith. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to race off and go and hold a giant meeting with 400 people. But if God gives you that opportunity, why not? But just trust God. Simply trust him to meet people's needs. And so when people come with need, just ask him if you can pray with them. Real simple. Ah, you meet somebody, ask them if there's something God could do for them. And some of them may get crazy and ask about the mega millions. And I'd love to tell them that, you know, oh, yeah, God will do that for you. But it will probably bring more destruction into your life than anything else. So, you know, I might go a little more reasonable and say, no, is there really something going on in your life that you need God to meet? And pray with them. And believe God to meet that need. It's going to do two things. It's going to prove to them that people care. It's actually going to do three things. It's going to prove to them also that God will move in their life. 
but it's also going to really encourage you because you're going to get end up hearing. Because trust me, when God meets those needs, people come running back. And they tell you that God met those needs. And you end up with some of the best experiences ever seeing God do great things. So that's my challenge. It's just simply trust God to meet a need. They need help with an electric bill, pray for them. They need help with a gas bill, pray for them. You think that the Lord who owns a cattle on a thousand hills can't take care of an electric bill or a gas bill or can't make food appear for them or any other things? And uh, by the way, if the Lord lays it on your heart then afterwards, he may use you in that prayer too, and that may be an expansion. But just let's start with believing God and seeing God be God. We have, we have some friends that were in the ministry, retired now, but every single waitress, if you go to eat with them, you got to know they're going to ask the waitress. They're going to ask for the waitress or waiter's name, and then they're going to ask what they can pray for. And they will. They'll pray right there in the restaurant with them. And then they'll follow up. They go back and have restaurant food at the restaurant a few days later just to see what God did. Why? Because God answers prayer. That's something we know. We know that God does it. And so we trust God for it. So I'm going to pray while the worship team comes, and then we're going to sing victory in Jesus so that we can all celebrate that which we have.